Welcome to Walking by Faith. Today, Pastor Dwayne emphasizes the power of forgiveness and keeping our hearts pure and aligning with God's Word. Let's dive into today's message, Defeating the Enemy Through Forgiveness. So today we're going to continue, really, a series of messages that we're doing on reversing the devil's decisions. I think we've all heard that God has a plan for your life, and it is true. He does have a plan for your life. Now, one of the things that many people do not know is that you do not need to cooperate with God's plan. You, you, you can go in a different direction. But God's plan, well, Jesus said it this way. He said, I've come that you may have life and have it abundantly. God wants you to have an abundant life in every area. In Jeremiah, it says it like this. The Lord says, I know the thoughts that I have towards you, thoughts of peace and not evil to give you a future and a hope. Jesus really gives the devil's job description in John 10, 10, when he says he only comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Now, if you think about it, why would anybody want to be connected to the devil even one more day when you know his ultimate goal is to kill, steal, and destroy? So 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil. The devil is not the sum total of, the, of evil in the universe. The devil is a fallen angel. He is a malevolent, wicked, evil spirit. Jesus personally confronted him. And the Bible says he's your adversary. And he goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. If you live your life, like many Christians, as if the devil did not even exist, he is going to eat your lunch. The Bible says you need to resist him, steadfast in the faith. And he's going about looking for whom he may devour. He devours ignorant people. He devours passive people. He devours people who cooperate with him, who open a door. For example, the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, it says, be angry, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down in your wrath. Don't give Satan a foothold. You, you can do things that open the door for the enemy to come into your life and to, to, to literally bring that kill, steal, and destroy so we, we've already looked at but what I would call point number one, which was simply, you get on track, stay on track, don't look back. And today we're kind of talking about point number two, which is when you get hit, don't quit. When you get hit, don't quit. Everybody eventually is going to take a hit, but don't quit. Remember, God's got a plan for you. And, and, and honestly, when I think about God's plan, in some ways... It's, it's like the GPS in my truck. How many of you have ever made a wrong turn? And that thing just says, recalculating. <laughs> and it just gets you right back on track. It, it, God does the same thing. But what often happens is we are just looking at our past. And here's what I want you to rem remember about the devil. The Bible says one of his names is the accuser of the brethren. And he's always going to focus on your past. He's going to look at your failures, your shortcomings, your sins. And he's going to focus on those things that are in your past. And when we're looking back and not at the future, right, when we lose that vision of where God wants us to go, we ultimately tend to go back to where we were. And a great example of this is Peter. So Peter denies the Lord. In fact, he's, he's calling curses down on himself, saying, I don't even know the man. Well, after the resurrection, Peter is still looking back at what he did. And, and I love what the Bible, this is what Peter said. He said to them, I'm going fishing. I'm go what was Peter before Jesus called him? A fisherman. And what did he do? Fish. So he's lost his vision for the future because of what he's done. And what does he want to do? Go fishing. 
Go fishing. You, know, you need to have a picture on the inside of you of your purpose. You know, somebody said the two greatest days of your life are the day that you're born and the day you find out why. Because God has a reason for you being here. You have a purpose. Uh, I've worked closely with a pastor who lost their church building. He came into the situation, um, took over a, a work that was in decline. They hadn't made any principal payments on the building in a long time. They had a tremendous cost of upkeep. They had all kinds of deferred maintenance. And ultimately, they were forced into selling the building. And this pastor literally went into a deep depression. Because what he thought he was going to do, where he was going to go, was connected to that building. And he just kept looking back at, well, if we would have, and we could have, and we should have, and what about this, and what about that? But I remember when they found a new building. And we're able to get into it. It was when, when he saw where he could go and how God could use them in the future, everything changed. Remember this. The devil will always try to get you to look at the past and how your failures have limited you, how your failures eliminate you as a possibility for God to use you. Look at the great missionary. The greatest missionary of Christianity is the Apostle Paul. He was literally taught the gospel by Jesus. He went to heaven, and he said, I saw things there I can't even talk about. Came back to talk about it. He wrote approximately half of the books in the New Testament. But if you look at him, he had a terrible past. He was a persecutor of the church. He had actually voted to have Stephen put to death and guarded the coats of the people that martyred Stephen. But this is what he said. In fact, I think that if we could get Paul here and we say, Paul, we want you to help us. He said, well, this is the number one thing I want you to understand. You're a Christian. Now, this is the number one thing. This is what he said. He said, number one, he said, I don't count myself to have apprehended. In other words, he says, I don't know it all. I still have room to grow, room to improve, room where God's going to be able to work in me and he's going to be able to use me more. Whenever you think you've arrived and you don't need to grow anymore, you're in trouble. But then he says, but this one thing I do. If we would say, Paul, give us one sermon, I think this would be it. Forgetting the things that are behind, I reach towards those things that are ahead. So the devil's going to focus you on your past. And by the way, when he does, you should remind him of his future. Revelation 20, verse 10, all right? says that the devil is cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Remind him of his future when he tries to point you towards your past. But Paul says, this is the thing that I do. I forget those things that are behind, and I'm reaching towards those things that are ahead. And again, remember, who is he? He's the accuser of the brethren. I remember as a young minister, Jeannie and I were were missionaries in Mexico. We had started a church, and uh, an old missionary, he was old then, my goodness. He's going to be 102 this month, one of my mentors, Wayne Myers. Most of my mentors are dead. I don't know how that happens, you know. I guess when you get old, that's what happens. But he's going to be 102 this month. He came over to our house, and he was talking with us, and he kind of perceived what was going on on the inside of me. Now, let me just say this about mentors. Uh, Some of them you really can't get close to. You can read a book. You can listen to a podcast. But it's really great when you can have a flesh and blood person that you can have a relationship with, all right? And nobody reaches their potential without mentors, Nobody. So he came over to our house and he looked at the situation and he realized what was happening to me. No matter what I did, I didn't feel like it was enough. If I read 10 chapters in the Bible, I thought I should have done 20. If I prayed for six people, it was like, you should have prayed for 12. If I witnessed to 18 people, he said, you should have witnessed to 25. And no matter what I did, 
I just never felt like it was enough. And, and I, I really kind of started to just kind of slide down like, man, I'm just no good. I'm no good. And I remember him looking at me and, and he, because I was in that, I can't pray enough. I don't study enough. I don't witness enough. And uh, he said to me, he said, every night when you go to bed, this is what you do. He said, Lord Jesus, I did all the things that I did today because I love you. I ask you to bless those things that I did today. Then he said, say in Jesus' name, amen, and go to bed and never look back. Never look back. Because the devil will tell you, you didn't do enough. You should have done more. What you did wasn't good enough. He, will, he is the accuser of the brethren. The past, listen, it's a dead issue. And you can't gain any momentum moving forward towards tomorrow if you're dragging your past behind you. And unfortunately, that's what many people do. They drag their past wherever they go. And as a result, they can't make any progress going ahead. So I want to mention a couple of things that, are, that I believe will help you forget your past. Put it behind you. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone, that's you, is in Christ, you're a believer. You're in union with Christ. You are a new creature, a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You see, when God looks at you, you're new. In fact, some, yeah, well, that happened, you know, 10 years ago when I got saved. The Bible says this, the outward man perishes, but the inward man is renewed every day. Do you know God makes you new every day? Every day. If you're in Christ, the old has passed away. Behold, all has become new. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him that knew no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. God took all of your unrighteousness and put it on Jesus at the cross. And Jesus died and paid for your unrighteousness. When Jesus said, it is finished, that means paid in full. Paid in full. How many of you have ever had somebody, you were at a restaurant and somebody else paid the bill? You know, it would be kind of an insult if you went and said, no, I want to pay myself. I know you pay, but I'm going to pay too. Well, that would be silly. And it's silly for you to try to pay for your sins when Jesus already paid in full and left a big tip. He more than covered it. It is finished. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Hebrews 8, 12. In their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. I, I picture heaven at times, and, and this is what I think is happening. All right? A Christian has sinned, and they ask God for forgiveness. Do you know what? He forgives you immediately. I remember years ago, there was a guy came up, and uh, he says, you know, I, I've, I've sinned, and I, I just can't get forgiveness. And, and I said, what do you mean? He says, I asked God, but I just don't feel forgiven. And I said to him, I said, uh, I'm not recommending you do this. Right? I heard somebody did this, and I thought I'd try it. So I said to him, I said, well, why don't you just cuss right now? He said, no. No, he said, God would hear and I said, so God won't hear you when you pray and repent, but he'll hear you if you cuss. <laughs> he went, oh. <laughs> kind of like, oh. So, so you, you, you ask God, when you ask God to forgive you, the Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what do we do? We come back the next day and the next week. And sometimes it's years later. And, oh, God, I am so sorry. And I think God looks over at Gabriel and said, what in the world is he talking about? Gabriel says, I don't know. God, go me either. Remember, he actually said this. He said, I will cast your sins into the depths of the sea. And Tory, Corey Ten Boom said he puts up a no fishing sign. Huh? So God has forgotten. He says, I will remember no more. And you're like, oh, God, I'm so bad. God, forgive me. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. And God says, Gabriel, what is that about? Gabe says, I don't know. God says, check it out. Get on the computer. They put your name in. 
You know what comes up? Justified, washed in the blood, new creature in Christ, adopted into the family, translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of your love, and we're building him a mansion at the corner of Hallelujah Street and Glory Avenue. And God's like, what are they talking about? What are they talking about? Because your sins and iniquities he will remember no more. Romans 3.25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, literally a sacrifice through faith in his blood. So Jesus is your sacrifice when you believe his blood paid in full for your sin. Those are the things of the past. So we need to put our past behind us. But here's one of the, the key things about putting your past behind you. In fact, I, I would kind of say it like this. Now, this is what Jesus said. Jesus said, Matthew 12, he said, make the tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make the tree bad and the fruit will be bad. Now, the fruit is your heart. So you can make your heart good or you can make your heart bad, all right? So in Mark 4, Jesus tells the parable of the sower. He sows the seed. The seed is the word of God. And he said it falls on four kinds of hearts. Ground, four kinds of hearts. So it's not the seed that determines the harvest. It's the ground. Jesus said some ground is hard. And the birds, the devil comes and steals that word. He said, others of it, it's like in rocky places, and it has no depth, right? And he says, it sprouts up, but it never produces it. It withers away. He says, other ground, he, he said, it's like you're, you're planting your seed among thorns. He says, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desire for other things, enter in and choke the word. And other hearts are like good ground. And when the seed of the word of God is planted, produces 30, 60, and 100-fold. Now listen, Jesus said you can make your heart good or you can make your heart bad. Where your heart is today does not need to be where your heart will be forever. In fact, in many people's life, it's like a progression. They go through different stages. At one point, they're shallow. At another point, they're, they're thorny. And then at another point, they make their heart good, and the word of God produces in their heart. One of the absolute keys to making your heart good is to forgive. I'll say that again. A key to the kingdom to make your heart good is to forgive the people that have treated you wrong. And by the way, when you forgive, it doesn't mean it's all right. The reason you need to forgive is because it was wrong. What they did was wrong. That's, if it wasn't wrong, you wouldn't need to forgive them. But you must forgive to leave the effects of the past behind you. When Jesus teaches us to pray, he said, pray, our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts or our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Right? In, in the simplest prayer that Jesus gives, he talks about forgiveness. Jesus, in Mark chapter 11, gives the largest discourse any place in the Bible on the subject of faith. And this is how he concludes. Whenever you stand praying, one translation says, every time you pray. If you have anything against anyone, forgive him. Right? So we've got three all-inclusive things here. Listen to it. Every time, anything, anyone. Well, what about anything? But what about anything? But what about if she, anyone, doesn't matter who, doesn't matter what. When we forgive, we are not changing that person's life as much as we're changing our life. 
because that unforgiveness affects you. Remember, Jesus, well, in, in Ephesians 4, be angry, don't sin, don't let the sun go down on your anger, nor give place to the devil. Unforgiveness gives Satan an opportunity to come in and attack our lives. I want you to think, just think about Jesus. The night he was betrayed, Judas comes and betrays Jesus with a kiss. And this is what Jesus said, friend, friend. You know what? Jesus didn't even let that offense go into his heart. It went off Jesus like water off a duck's back. He would not even let an offense go into his heart. On the cross, Jesus prays. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. How many know Jesus is our example? In the, later in the book of Acts, we find Stephen being stoned to death for his faith in Jesus. In Acts 7, it says, Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. You know what he's doing? He's imitating Jesus. He says, don't charge them with this sin. Um, I have a personal friend who was in uh, a Muslim nation. And he was brought to talk with a very influential person there. And this person had taken and murdered, tortured to death a pastor. And as he's torturing this pastor to death, this pastor keeps saying to him, you can't make me hate you. He says, I love you, and Jesus loves you. You can't make me hate you. I love you, and Jesus loves you. So this man, afterwards, he said, I could not sleep. What he said just kept running through my mind and running through my mind and running through my mind. My friend sat down with him, talked with him, and led him to Jesus. Do you know that's the power of the gospel and the power of forgiveness? It's the power of forgiveness. So this is what the Bible says, Romans 12. Repay no one evil for evil. How I many know when somebody slaps you what you want to do? Yeah. Repay no one evil for evil, but have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And as much as it is possible, if it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. So as much as it's possible, how many know there's some people you just can't live peaceably with? They, they would, but you make every effort to live peaceably with them. And, and there may be times when you need to separate from somebody. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. Say it again. Do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it's written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So don't avenge yourself. Now, there are three things that can happen when someone does something wrong. The number one is what we hope happens, all right? That they come to Jesus, they receive Jesus, and just like he forgave you, he'll forgive them. If not, the second thing that can happen, if we see nothing happen in this life, but there's going to be a judgment day. And when that judgment day comes, Jesus is going to make every wrong right. You understand that? To a degree that you and I, I don't even think can comprehend. Psalms 110 says this, he will fill the place with dead bodies. And that's talking about what Jesus is going to do on judgment day. Right? So they may receive forgiveness just like you. Right? It may be that nothing happens until judgment day. Right? But there is a third alternative that sometimes happens. And I would give you Acts chapter 12 as an example. We have Herod the king. He takes James, a leader of the church, and beheads James. Then he grabs Peter, puts Peter in prison, and he's planning to have Peter killed. An angel of the Lord comes, opens the door, and Peter escapes. But at the end of the chapter, Herod gets up, and he gives a speech about how great he is. And gives no thanks or credit to God. And listen, this is what the Bible says. The angel of the Lord smote him with worms and he died. Right? You say, what is that? Vengeance is mine, I will repay. 
It may be that they, there's a payment in this life, but if there's not, 100% of the time, there's a payment in the life to come. Either Jesus makes the payment, God judges, or it's an eternal judgment. Vengeance is mine, God says, I will repay. He says, do not avenge yourself. What do you do? You forgive. You forgive, all right? Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will keep coals on his head. And do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. When someone does you evil and you avenge yourself, all that you're doing is continuing the cycle of evil, all right? And God says, don't do that. Don't do that. He says, you do them good. In fact, Jesus said, pray for those that spitefully use you, those that mistreat you. He says, you pray for them, all right? 20 plus years ago now, probably, I, I, I was at a conference in Seattle, Washington, and Dr. Cho, at that time, the pastor of the largest church in the world, 800,000 members in his church. I, I will never forget him saying, I have to pray four hours a day because I hate so many people. I must forgive. <laughs> uh, I have had two people in 50 years of ministry that really hurt me. Um, I prayed for them this morning. Now, I've been praying for them for years. And let me just tell you what I, I pray. God, have mercy. God, bless them. God, reveal yourself to them. But you know what? In the beginning, it was difficult. But you know what? I can tell you this with total to, like, there, there's just no reserve in me on this. If I heard that the, the greatest thing you could think of had happened to one of those people, I'd be like, yes! I don't want them to pass. I want them to get blessed. You say, what is that? Well, the Bible says God enlarges your heart. People that at one time you felt something bad towards, if you will keep on praying for them, something's going to happen on the inside of you. God's going to enlarge your heart. And God will give you compassion for that pe person. Now, Christians, what we are to be is the forgiving community of forgiven sinners. We are to be the forgiving community of forgiven sinners. In May of 1981, a Turkish man made his way to Rome. His name was Ali Adja, but he traveled with Rome with the intention of assassinating the Pope. The, the Pope, John Paul II, went through the streets of St. Peter's Square, and Ali Adja made his way as close as he could. And at nearly point blank range, he opened fire. He shot the Pope four times. He was immediately arrested on the scene, but the Pope was in critical condition was in surgery for six hours, 22 days in the hospital. But what happened later is this. Pope John Paul, when he recovered, he visited an Italian prison, and he went to see his would-be assassin, Ali Adja, the man who had shot him four times. And he sat down with him for a half an hour. He took his hand, and he held his hand, and he forgave him. And he became his friend. In fact, he left saying, I have made a new friend. And it's interesting, later, years later, he, he was sick, and it was Ali Aja who sent him a get well card. It literally captivated the minds of the media. Uh, the media just couldn't understand, why would the Pope pardon the gunman? And in fact, it's really a picture of the gospel. It's a picture of forgiveness a picture of Christianity, a picture of the church. It's a picture of the imitation of Christ because that's what, that's what the Pope was doing. He was imitating Jesus. In, in, in fact, I think we've got a picture that was on Time magazine. It made the cover. Why forgive? And that, that's, the real, that's the real picture right there. Now, as you, as you think about it, you probably identify with the Pope. 
I need to forgive somebody, right? I need to forgive them. And I want to ask you this question. Who is the Ali Aja in your life? Is there somebody that fired a gun at your heart by the things that they said, by the things that they did? Is there somebody that literally penetrated into your heart that you need to forgive? They abused you. They stole from you. They wronged you. They denied you. You were a victim of their prejudice. You were treated unfairly. Whenever that happens and we suffer an injustice, what the Bible tells you and I that we need to do is we need to forgive. Be angry. Don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't give the devil an opportunity. So, so there's, here, here's, here's what Christians need to do. We need to forgive. But understand this about forgiveness. Forgiveness is not a feeling. When Peter came to Jesus and said, how often should I forgive those that, that sin against me? Seven times? And Jesus said, no, 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 no. Seventy times seven. All right? And this was in a single day. And this is what the disciples said. Lord, increase our faith. Lord, increase our faith. Now, we laugh, but it is extremely important, all right? Because you do not forgive because of how you feel. You forgive by faith. Forgiveness is a decision that you make. I release that person. I pray for that person. And I leave them in God's hands, right? That is a decision that you make. Now, faith without works is dead. And Jesus taught us what our work should be. You pray for them every day. God, have mercy on them. God, bless them. God, reveal yourself to them. And you do that every day. So the first thing is you forgive by faith. Not because you feel like it, but you've made the decision. I'm going to do this by faith. I forgive them. I release them. And then, number two, you pray for them. Right? You pray for them. And then number three, repeat one and two. (laughs) As often as you need to, you just keep repeating one and two, right? And what will happen is this. God will work in your heart. God will work in your heart. And remember what Jesus said, either make the tree good and its fruit will be good, or make the tree bad and the fruit will be bad. One of the absolute keys It is probably the number one key to making your heart good ground is to forgive those that have mistreated you, to be an imitator of Jesus. What Jesus said to his apostles was this. He said, go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. You know what a disciple is? It's an imitator. It's an imitator of Jesus. And that's what we're supposed to be. We forgive just like Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, our King, forgave. The most important question in every person's life is, am I ready to meet God? Am I forgiven? Am I going to end up in heaven? Many people don't even realize you can know. The Bible says we've written these things to you that you may know that you have everlasting life. Romans 10, 13 says, whosoever, that's you, will call on the name of the Lord. That's what we're gonna do. The rest of the verse says, will be saved. If you will pray this prayer from your heart and believe the things that I'm saying in this prayer, you're gonna be right with God. So I'm gonna ask you to pray this prayer out loud with me from your heart. Just say, oh God, I believe that Jesus died on the cross that his blood paid for my sins, and that he rose again. Victorious over death, over sin, and over the devil. And I give Jesus all of my heart and all of my life. I hold nothing back. I receive Jesus as my Savior, as my Lord, as my King, and I'm going to live for him. I thank you. You've heard my prayer. My past is gone. I'm a part of your kingdom today and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you prayed that prayer from your heart, God heard that prayer and you are right with God. I want you to keep growing spiritually. The Bible actually tells us God's goal for us is to keep growing until we become like Christ. 
Well, I wrote a book to help you keep on growing. All the information on how to get that book absolutely free is right on your screen. Please contact us. Thank you so much for being with us today. God bless you. Congratulations on taking this amazing step with Jesus. We're thrilled for your new journey. If you have questions or want to learn more, our team is here to support you. To get your free copy of Pastor's book, Your New Life, click on the link in the description or download the Walking by Faith app. This book is packed with practical advice for a faith-filled life. Don't miss out. Claim your free copy today. Check out this powerful mini book, Reversing the Devil's Decisions by Pastor Dwayne, packed with biblical wisdom and real life stories to inspire and transform your life. God has an amazing plan for you, full of abundance, while the devil's plan leads to misery. God's incredible love gives you the freedom to choose your path. Dive into this testimony filled mini book and learn how to walk in victory. To purchase your copy, visit the WBF store at walkingbyfaith.tv. Light a spark of hope. Your generous support fuels Walking by Faith's mission to share God's message globally. Every gift, big or small, ignites hope in lives around the world. To give, click on the giving link in the description below or click on the giving icon in our app. Thank you for your unwavering support in spreading the message of hope and healing through God's word. As you go forward this week, make the choice to forgive. Let go of past hurt and keep your eyes fixed on the future God has for you. If you need prayer, have questions, or need support, our prayer team is here for you. Leave us a comment or click the prayer link below to connect with our prayer team. Thank you for joining us today, and may God's wisdom and peace guide you always.